Philippians through uh, three times in January, you get an extra five points. Okay. So were there any questions about last week's lesson? Okay. Short recap. We talked about two main things. Philippians was written by Paul while being imprisoned after much suffering before he was he was killed. So he was imprisoned in Rome twice. It was written at the end of that first imprisonment. And then the second thing that we talked about, um, uh, for Christ to be exalted would mean that Paul was not put to shame, regardless of you know any kind of uh, what happens to him physically. I guess that's really the, the main points from last week. So with that being said, just a little quick group question here. What is the purpose of the church? What do you guys think? Why do you go to church? What's the purpose? To worship. To worship? Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Uh, to worship Christ. Okay. Is there anything else? Uh, to uh, be around others. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to not yeah. rush you. you yeah. If you're done, that's fine. Uh, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Nicole, you got anything? To learn more about Christ. Okay. Anything else? Okay, that's fine. Chuckle. Chuckle buckle. Um, to help build up the body of Christ. Okay. Anything else? Grace? Chuck stole my answer. Ha. <laughs> and to um, verify, I don't think verify is the wrong word, but you know, like um, confirm doctor, doc, doctrine, you know, make sure everybody's on the right level. Okay. Anybody else want to say anything? Okay. Not overly talkative tonight, huh? <laughs> you, you used up all your words in taboo, yeah. huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, but, okay. So, uh, one thing I noticed when I was reading through Philippians. Did anybody get a chance to read through Philippians at all yet? No. Okay. Um, one thing... As long as you read Genesis 1-1, that's all the answers in the whole world right there. So... <laughs> Um, one thing I noticed when I was reading through Philippians um, was the idea of a Christian outside of the church goes against everything Paul had in mind. If you read through Philippians, he never imagined the idea of a Christian not being in church. And I find that so mind-blowing because nowadays it's very common for Christians to not be in church. I mean, you know, they have either house churches or they just don't do church at all. You know, but they still claim to be Christian, but they don't, just don't do that. Mm -hmm. But for Paul, it's just like it never even entered his mind that that would ever be a possibility. Huh. It just blows my mind away. You know, you, sometimes you forget that over 2,000 years, you know, some of the main points of Christianity have somewhat changed. Right. You know, some things that we have a problem with, Paul didn't. And some things Paul had a problem with, we just don't. So anyways... Um, it seems like he kind of thought it thought of it as a lung that claws its way out of the body. Just a lung. Think of a lung that just crawled out of your body and you're just lying on the ground. No purpose, no chance. It just that's not how it's meant to be. Yeah. And so, the, so I want you to keep that keep that imagery in mind when we're going through Philippians. We'll start uh, where we left off in chapter one, verse twenty-one. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better. Yet, to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. So, obviously we can see here that he's been kind of thinking about things <laughs> while imprisoned. I have a if if being imprisoned was anything like it is now, you have a little bit of thinking time, huh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Paul is praying, but he doesn't know exactly what he what he prefers. Is he praying for for life, or is he praying for death? And you can just see him kind of going back and forth. But you can see him kind of resting on this idea that, you know, I do still have a purpose, which takes us to 25 through 26. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. So since it would be better for them, he has become convinced that God will preserve his life for their sake. Um, notice that he doesn't know what he prefers. And so, you know, I, I don't know which one, life or death, you know, it's it, this one's better for me, this one's better for you. And you can see that he's been praying about it and wrestling with it. Um, but as he's been praying, it, it, it seems like what he's saying is, you know, God's shown me about how... Um, 
how my staying will, will actually be a benefit to you. And so it seems to me, I'm pretty convinced here that, you know, uh, I will be um, living for a little bit so I can continue to encourage you. Right. Um, see, his thinking throughout this book is so much different than we think. You know, he's not saying I have such I have good vibes. I have hopes that I will be get out because he doesn't even know for sure if he wants to get out. <laughs> he's just saying this seems like what's best for you guys. So that seems like Whatever. you know what's going to happen. Um, so then, verse twenty-seven: Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. See, right there we have a little bit of we know that he's not just talking about happy hopes and dreams because look, look what he says. Connect yourselves in a manner, okay, mm -hmm. so that whether I come to see you or remain absent. But I thought you just said that you were so convinced that you would come. Hmm. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. he, he's not hes not saying, I know I will get out because I, I, I believe that I will get out, so I will get out. You know, he's not hes not talking about just hopes and dreams. He's talking about, I, I, I'm, I'm convinced that, that God's going to do something here because he wants to strengthen you. But regardless... Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether or not that happens, whatever, I will hear of you, I hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the, of the gospel. So be united together. Don't use the struggle as a reason to be short towards others. Don't turn against each other. One one thing that he's trying to say and trying to show here is, okay, so you guys are going through struggles. Let let this be an opportunity. To be on the same page, because what happens when we when we start going through things that are just kind of difficult? We start turning on each other. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It happens in, in every arena of life, and in, in marriage, and in friendship, in, in church, and in, in pastoring, and in, I mean, in work, every area of life, this is going to happen. When when we start going through difficult times, we start turning on people. So his answer is only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit. With one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. See, if you're conducting yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, you will be standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. It was completely unheard of for him, for a Christian, to be outside of the church. Because if you were conducting yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, you would be uniting yourself in one purpose, with the body. That, that's his whole idea here. So to remove, if I'm not in church, you're literally overlooking his entire main thrust of his point. It was completely foreign to everything he had. He, that just blows my mind, and it doesn't really seem like it's blowing your guys' mind. But I really, this was like eye-opening, eye you know, explosion in my mind kind of kind of situation. Anyways, going to verse 28. Uh, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. See, what I thought he was saying... I thought he was saying that it is a sign of destruction for them when you are able to stand firm and they cower before you. That's that's not what he said. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but a salvation for you, and that too from God. Stand firm in the face of opposition. When you stand firm in the face of opposition, that that, that is the mark. Not that other people are cowering before you, but, but that you are standing firm. Which is a sign of their destruction and your salvation. Victory isn't in God proving you right or people cowering before you. See, what we think is if I'm right, then I'm gonna, I'm just gonna be able to, to, to I'm just gonna know I'm gonna write, and everybody's just gonna like kind of cower before me, and they're, they're gonna know he was right, and, and God's gonna go and tell them in prayer time you were wrong and he was right. You know, we have all these ideas in our mind of how God's gonna prove us right and everything. That's not what Paul is saying. He's saying the sign of their destruction is that you stand firm. He's not talking about being obstinate or somehow arrogant or being somebody who's starting fights and bullcrap. He's saying that you're standing firm in the faith. So you should have to be a blessing to others. Okay, Philippians 1.29. For to, you is it, for, for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. I don't know about you guys, but when I go through hard times, I kind of get a why me mentality. 
Why is this happening to me? Yeah. Have I somehow displeased you, God? Why don't you focus all this energy and, and you know, trials? Why don't you go give them to somebody else that disobeyed you? Why do you keep punishing me for doing the right thing? But in Paul's thinking, suffering is a blessing from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake. You have been given the privilege for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And Paul says this throughout, throughout his letters. I looked. <laughs> I looked. It's not just in this one. It's throughout his letters. He talks about how trials and temptations are a blessing from God. And then this is repeated again in he, James? James, where he says, you know, count it all joy when you experience trials and temptations. Oh, well, hooray, I'm going through bad times, <laughs> Yeah. I guess, Ooh. or whatever. <laughs> and they aren't uh, the only ones suffering. So uh, the second part of that, that, that the Philippian church isn't the only one suffering. Look, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me. See, sometimes when we, when we go through suffering, we think that we're the only ones suffering. Yeah. But what he's saying is, A, your suffering is a blessing from God. B, I'm going through it too. Experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. So just a quick note on chapter 2. Um, life in Christ is life in a Christian community, and that's really one of, one of the main thrusts of chapter 2. So if you don't get that point, you're not going to – or pick up on it in the, in the big first chapter, you're really not going to understand the next couple verses. Um, let's read through verse 4, I think. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. So now we see him kind of expanding on the idea that he mentioned in chapter 1 in verse 27. Whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Here he revisits that but kind of expands on it. Um... Maintain the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Verse 3. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And that verse for um, NASB is extremely literal, and I would still change it slightly. If I had to tran translate it, I, I would do something like this. Do not look out for your, uh, for your own interests, or... Look out for other people's interests, not your own. It's a very, very exaggerated sentence. In other words, he's not saying look out for them and yourself as well. He's saying, do not look out, look out for your interests. Look out for other people's interests. See, we kind of go to two extremes here. We look for our interest. Right. Got to watch out for number one. Or we do, okay, I'll watch out for them and me. Yeah. And Paul is being extremely other focused here. Do not look out for your own interests. Look out for their interest. Which completely changes the idea of how we approach this. So now let's look at this verse by verse, okay? Our encouragement is from unity with Christ. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ Can I see your your CSB, buddy? Yep. I the NESB gets a little bit confusing and wordy on this part. I think the CSB has, has it a lot a better. More. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, okay? So right there should clue, should clue us in. Any encouragement in Christ. Okay. All right. Our encouragement is from unity with Christ, which is obeying him and looking forward to what is to come and knowing him. Okay? That's, that, that's our source of encouragement. Let's run through those things again. Obeying him. Living life how he said to live your life. Looking forward to what is to come. Not just in the next life, but knowing that God has a plan for what's coming up, leading up to my death. And knowing him. There's a there's encouragement that comes just from knowing God, okay? So if, if, the, body, if the body is Christ's body, that would mean to reject the body would be to reject... Christ. And that's one of his main purposes here. I'm trying to turn this off so it won't vibrate again. 
Um, okay, so then that takes us to the second thing he says, if any consolation of love. Okay, uh, is there... Let me let me compare these two. The NASB says if there's any consolation of love, and that CSB does too. Does anybody have an ESB? I got ESB. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love. Okay, let's right there. That's a good one. Comfort okay. from love. Um, so our comfort is from the love of God in His body. Okay, so our encouragement is from our unity with Christ. Mm -hmm. Our comfort is from the love of God. Okay, all right. That takes us to the third thing. And so, translations read this one differently. Um, CSB says, if any fellowship with the Spirit. NASB says, any fellowship with the, uh, of the Spirit. So with the Spirit, of the Spirit, real similar. Basically what it's saying is fellowship of the Spirit. Um, so I think that NASB probably has it has it better than the CSB on this part. Um, so our fellowship is a result of the work of the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? We as a church have fellowship because of what the Holy Spirit is doing. Okay, and it takes us to, to the last thing. He just says uh, two things: um, affection and mercy, or if, in the NSB, affection and compassion. What does the ESV say? Um, At the end of and affection and sympathy. Okay, so compassion, sympathy, or uh, mercy, depending on what your translation is. Here you go. So churches should be characterized by tenderness and compassion. Now, I want you to stop and think about that. A church should be known for tenderness and compassion or sympathy right. or mercy. What do you think people think of when they think of a church? Judgmental. 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 Okay, anything else? Uh, hypocritical. Hypocritical. Okay. Very good answers. Judgmental, hypocritical. Anything else? I mean, I think those two are pretty good already, yeah, but... <laughs> yeah. I think that pretty much sums it up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But what Paul says here is that they should be known by affection and compassion, or tenderness and compassion, or yeah, tenderness and, and sympathy, mm -hmm. however you want it. That changes things. Yeah. <laughs> so if there if there is any encouragement in Christ, any encouragement whatsoever, if there is any love whatsoever from God. If there's any love, if there is any fellowship from the Holy Spirit, if there is any, if you guys are known by any any kind of affection and sympathy, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. So what he's doing here uh, is kind of making a, an appeal. If these things are true of the body, which they should be, he's saying that they should be, if these things are true, which is kind of a rhetorical thing, um, then make my joy complete by being of the same mind. So he's talking about here, put forth an effort. Put forth an effort. Um, so heartfelt sympathy, affection for each other, that word compassion has a lot of different uh, nuances to it. Heartfelt sympathy is, is a good idea. Um, because, once again, translations aren't always as precise. So think of it as more of a concept. Heartfelt compassion. Heart, I'm sorry, heartfelt sympathy. Or affection for each other. Now, I, I did mess up on the top there. That's supposed to say 2-2 two, two to 2-4. Two, mm -hmm. um, okay, so. Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Okay, so if those things have been at all by being a Christian then be united with each other and live intentionally. Now, what do I mean by living intentionally? By being of the same mind. Would you say that you are of the same mind with the church? Are you heading in the same direction? Do you have the same purpose? Are you? Would you say that you're like this with the pastor in his direction, or would you say that you're like this with the pastor in his direction? Think about it. I'm not asking for answers. I'm asking for you guys to think about what I'm saying. So if there is any any if you have found any encouragement and love and fellowship and all those good things affection compassion any of those things make my joy complete by being of the same mind maintaining the same love united in spirit intent on one purpose intent on it so um, verses three and four. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Not as important as yourselves, as more important than yourselves. 
do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And I already told you about how I would translate that slightly differently. Uh, so don't look out for number one is the main thrust here. But go out of your way for others. So I, I just put that up there so you could see uh, my translation. Do not look out for your own interests. Um and really, that's the end of the Philippians, but we had a question that we're going to look at um, in just a minute. Um, but I, I want you guys to, to remember this part, because this is the, actually the passage you get, that um, is for the memorization. 2, 1 through 5. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. With humility of mind, regard one another, one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. The idea of getting your eyes off yourself. Because once again, when we go through persecution, we, we get this idea in our mind. I got to watch out for me because no one else will. That's what we're told. Yeah. But he's saying in the church, that's not how that's supposed to go. You're supposed to be intentional about looking out for other people. Do nothing from selfishness. But I got to watch out for, for, for number one. Do nothing from selfishness. See, that changes things. That says, okay, don't look out for number one. Look out for others. That completely changes the idea. And right here, we see glimpses of what the church is supposed to be like. What it's supposed to be like. So try to look past the 2,000 years of nonsense. <laughs> and try to look at what Paul is saying the church is supposed to be like. Okay? So uh, that takes us to a discussion question. Is assisted suicide wrong? Um, we're going to look at what the AG says, and then I'm going to offer my own two cents. Um, so basically, there's a few different ideas related with this. First off, one one is euthanasia. Um, you know, uh, assisted suicide. You know, the medical euthanasia. I believe the dictionary definition is uh, the medical um, a medical professional uh, aiding in the suicide process. I think is a. Meh. Good enough uh, definition of euthanasia. Um, assi assisted suicide um, is pretty much anyone who helps you commit suicide by various reasons. And then suicide is obviously where you kill, where you kill yourself. So we're looking at is assisted suicide wrong? Now, the Assemblies of God condemn both, whether it's medical or whether it's just yourself or whatever. And they have a whole article on it. I'm not going to read from it. You can if you want to. It's on the Assemblies of God's website. Um, it's ag.org or something like that, and you go to like statement papers or something like that. Uh, position papers. Topics? Topics. Yeah, and those have position papers there and, and all kinds of stuff. And you just go through them. They've got, they've got papers on all kinds of different stuff. Um, women in ministry, uh, suicide, um, alcohol. I mean, you just go – they have all kinds of stuff there. Um, but now my two cents. Suicide refuses to acknowledge God as sovereign over life and death. This is my biggest problem with suicide is it basically says – I decide when I die, and I don't think that really you find any examples in the Bible of that being a good thing. You know, if you read through the Bible, it constantly talks about, you have numbered my days, you know the day of my passing, help me to number my days, all these things about helping us to trust in God with our days. And see, but the problem is that becomes very complicated when you or someone that you know is in, is in pain, and you know that it's going to end with them dead. <laughs> so it's like, well, let's just kind of help this process along so they don't have to suffer. But one thing we have to remember is in Genesis, it talks about on the day that you eat of the fruit, you will die. Well, he didn't kill them that day. That means that every second that we have is given to us by God. Now, why would God keep us alive when we're in pain? I don't know. But God has ways that are somehow... Hard to understand, I think, is a good way of saying that. Yeah. So, anyways, uh, suicide refuses to acknowledge God as sovereign over life and death. That, that's that's kind of a big point. Um, it's kind of all throughout Scripture on that. Um, there's a few examples of people trying to kill themselves in the Bible, and God doesn't seem overly excited about it. One of them is Saul, who refused to look up, live God's way, and God told him that he would be killed in battle. But instead of listening to God, he decides to go and go to battle anyways. And then he gets mortally – well, it, we don't know if he was mortally wounded, but he thought he was mortally wounded. Um, 
why I say that is because a lot of people in battle think that they're going to die uh, because of, you know, the wound or the blood or whatever, and then they end up pulling through. So, um, but um, he asks his, basically his, his helper to go ahead and just kill him because he's going to die anyways. And he's like, uh, no. <laughs> and so then Saul's like, well, I'll just do it myself. And so he kills him, and it, it kills himself, and it kind of has this whole negative feel to it. You know what I mean? Throughout the whole passage, it just seems like something's off. Um, and then in light of all the times that God talks about him being the one who gives and takes life and everything, it's just it's hard to try and push past that. Let me keep going on. So assisted suicide borders murder, even if it's even if it's something that um, is there's agreement on or that would be better for them in pain wise. It's hard to kind of explain what I'm saying, but death, is, murder in the Bible is any is death for any reason other than legal punishment. Um, it was always considered something as negative, and um, when people were dying, were dying slow deaths in the Bible, it was just kind of a thing, a time for them to uh, prepare for their death, and a time for God to talk to them in, in a new way. Um, and by if they were to commit suicide, they would have just kind of circumnavigated that whole process. But that part is a very important part of our life. Suicide says human life is not sacred and that our time is over. But what if God was going to use our death, even if it was painful, to reach someone else? What if God was going to use our death through – I mean, really, there's a lot of different reasons, ways that people can die, and a lot of them are painful. But what if God was going to use that in such a way to touch people? And see, what we do is we overlook – Others, for the sake of our own pain, we do it for emotion, we do it for physical, we like to watch out for ourselves, and we don't like to go through pain, and it's uncomfortable to go through pain, <laughs> but at the end of the day, God has a way of turning our pain into uh, – let me give you a good example. I know one person who was dying, and it was supposed to be a very, very painful thing, and – they were I, – I, I never saw them that happy before in my entire life, and they were just so at peace, and it brought such closure to the family. It actually impacted a lot of their um, unsaved family members, and um, there's just so much beauty to the whole thing. you know. And then they died, and some of their family actually ended up getting saved from the process. So, I mean, that was just – now, obviously, God's not going to take away the pain every single time. But there is a certain lesson that can that can only be learned in our uh, as we die. It, you know, it's this process of trusting in God. And so what we think is, oh, I'm going to die anyway, so I'm just a wasted cause. Go ahead and let me die. But God is working in us even to the point of death. See, there's never a moment in our life when we have suddenly – Law, like we're no longer growing. We're no God no longer wants to do a work in us, and that's hard for us to understand because it's like, well, but if I'm in pain, why don't you just take me? Why why do you keep me alive to experience all this pain, God? But God is still working in us through those times. Uh, the Bible says a lot of different things about the value of life. Genesis obviously talks about how we're made in His image. Image. Uh, Job, his wife, says, hey, why don't you just curse God and die? You're in so much pain and you're going to die anyways. Why not just go ahead and just end it all? And not only is it kind of implied that that's not the right thing to do, but then Job continues and doesn't do that thing. And God actually restores him to health, which brings me to another point that I was kind of hinting towards. Sometimes we think that something's going to be terminal and it's not. Now, obviously, God doesn't always heal people. In fact, it's... If it was the normal occasion, it wouldn't be called a miracle. <laughs> a miracle is, by definition, something that God doesn't do all the time. So, you know, obviously he's not always going to heal us, but we, the moral of the story being we don't know what will happen. Um, so, uh, in Psalm 139.16, but I would like to say this question is slightly unfair. Because, I mean, it's really something that you could wrestle with for a lifetime. 
and I have to answer it in an evening. So uh, don't judge me too harshly. Psalm 139, 16 says this. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me. Ordained for me, that God set aside for me. When as yet there was not one of them. What that means, and other passages that I've not included to keep things shorter, is that when someone has an abortion, they don't destroy a potential life. They cut a life short. That person had a life that God planned out, and somebody killed that person before they got to live it out. When you commit suicide, or you help someone commit suicide, God said, hey, this story isn't done yet, and you said, oh, yep, yeah, it is. See what I mean? That's the big problem with suicide. As hard as it is, as painful for as it is, it's our burden to bear because we sinned against God. That's our burden now. Now, we don't have to like it the same as we don't have to like work. <laughs> But that's, once again, another part of our burden. We have to do these things. And no matter how you look at it, death is ugly. There's no such thing as a good... Well, you can die with honor, but there really is no such thing as a good death. Death is not good. But there is such a thing as God using a death. That is a thing. Um, so God is sovereign over life and death. We, don't know, we do not know what God will do. Uh, we do not know if God will heal us. We don't know if he will teach us something. And it assumes hearing from God is only val valuable if you're in perfect health. If you commit suicide, what you're saying is hearing from God can only benefit me if I'm in 100% perfect health. Well, what does that say for all the people who aren't in perfect health and want to hear from God? <laughs> what, what about all those people who have, who have a terminal illness that takes years to kill them? There was someone, I, I think you, it was your uncle or some something, or something, that he was supposed to have died, like, and he lived for months and months after the no, fact. he lived, like. Yeah, four years after he was supposed to die. Well, I don't know about you, but those four years would matter to me. Right. You know, and, and they, the doctors couldn't explain it, but evidently God said, hey, your time's not up yet. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, I don't know. Um, said that. Oh, but I would like to direct this this conversation in something in a direction that I feel like isn't really addressed very much in the church. Ask the que this very important question of yourself: How can I help them? When people are dying, it, it's a very emotional time for them. I know it's obviously for us. I, I know that, but we'll live to work through the situation and you know to kind of deal with the loss and you know losing someone is never easy. But we're going to be alive to to work on that. They won't be alive to work on it. They have to get their affairs in order. They have to, you know, say goodbye even if they're not ready. That's a very difficult thing to do. And I think sometimes we as, as Christians kind of put people who are in these kinds of situations on back burner. You know what I mean? We have our ministries that we see as important. Um, obviously, kids' ministries, I think that there's nothing more important than kids' ministries. Kids and youth, I think that's – I don't think there's anything more important than that. But, uh, you know – then you have, well, what about these other people? What about these people? You know, we forget about senior citizens who are, you know, they're kind of getting used to the idea that they won't have another 20 years. That must be a difficult idea, um, especially when they don't have good relationships with their family. Um, the terminally ill. Uh, this is another thing we just kind of glance past. So, you know, I, I do want you to be thinking about that. How can I help someone who is terminally ill. I have to be honest, I have no idea. But I'm willing to find out. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think that's really important. Uh, the next step, um, the next step of assisted suicide is other people making the choice for us. We've already, I'm not talking about paranoia. We've already seen this start to happen. Um, in England, for instance, where, okay, your child, we don't think it's going to live, so we're just going to go ahead and kill it. Uh, well, we got free shipping over here to America. This doctor says he'll do the work for free, and there's a 50% chance it'll live or whatever. No, we decided that he's going to, they're going to die. So, I mean, if we start allowing things, our, our government to start doing assisted suicide, they're going to start being the ones who decide when they assist people to suicide. Right. So I really think this is a dangerous Switch slope. Us, yes. Mm -hmm. And as I understand, it's actually getting to the point of it's, it's, we're deciding for you on this one. I might be wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure. Well, there was a guy recently, he was like, 
you know, I, it was last year or sometime, but he was like 98 or something, and he had decided that he had just lived too long. Uh huh. But he didn't want to kill himself. He wanted assisted suicide. Uh huh. And so America's laws do not allow that. So he <laughs> flew to Switzerland so that they would. <laughs> Who's from Australia? Oh. <laughs> well, I didn't hear that story. <laughs> And really what it all comes down to is, is is something that I want to leave you guys with, unless there's any questions or comments. There was another thing. Go ahead. I seen a story the other day. This guy had been in like some sort of accident, and he was in a coma. And they went to take him off the ventilator. So like, well, he's dead. You, there's nothing else we can do. I, I know and the story. he woke up the next day. Yeah. Perfectly fine. Nothing wrong with him. Wow. Yeah, I, 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 that, was, that made it onto that one belief net or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is the last thing I really want to leave you guys with this. Um, at the end of the day, either God is in control or we are in control. And that's a fact for all of our lives. It's not about a decision that we make at the end of our lives. It's a decision that we make throughout our lives. Either let God be in control or let you be in control. There's, n there's never any other option. And we have to make the decision now. Now, should the time come when you are in, in a slow, painful death, it's going to be very hard to stick to stick with that kind of an idea. You're going to probably have moments of, hey, I just want this to end. But it's in those times that we of pain that we learn to trust in God in a whole new way. And it kind of prepares us for eternity. So don't be afraid of the future. Um, if, if that comes to it, you have to, you have to just trust that God will bring you through whatever he brings you to. Um, I will say this. I'm not one of those people who thinks that, hey, marijuana is evil, but medication is good some of those medications are pretty jacked up pretty jacked up um my personal opinion is that marijuana is the better option of the two i've seen what those medications do and they're pretty out there um pretty destructive that's my own two cents though um i know people have different opinions with marijuana and whatnot i'm not talking about recreational use i'm talking about um, but yeah, medical use. Um, but and I understand that there's other opinions, and I'm not trying to get anybody to agree with me on that one. Um, so, anyways, the riddle of the week: A man is pushing his car along the road when he comes to a hotel. He shouts, "I'm bankrupt! Why?" I bet you.